All right, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Is this working? Can you hear yes. this? All right, thank you. Uh, so my name is Andy Pershing. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to tonight's Sea State Lecture. So this is the Joan M. Kelly Sea State Lecture Series, which was uh, uh, is funded in part by the generous contributions of the Kelly family and also by the Fish Vet Group uh, that uh, rents some space here in the building. Um, so uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, I think we're a really unique, in, uh, unique, unique organization in the region and that we're, as far as I know, the only uh, organization in the, in the region that is focused on the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and so you'll hear a little bit about the way we approach our research from Andrew tonight. Uh, but in addition to our research, uh, we also have an education program that includes this wonderful space. Uh, where we bring fifth and sixth graders for a three-hour uh, educational experience. We get about 70% of that cohort of kids in the state uh, every year, so it's a really unique thing that we do. Uh, we also have a community uh, engagement uh, group that does work primarily with fishing communities and with, uh, with fishermen in the fishing industry to try to really help make uh, fishing communities sustainable uh, in the long term, both ecologically and economically. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew Allen, who's our speaker tonight. Uh, so our, our lecture series this, uh, this fall is about uh, adventure and exploration. Uh, and when we put that together, I, I instantly thought about Andrew because Andrew has, uh, well, he's been on a number of adventures, which he'll talk a little bit about tonight. But I would say his career is, uh, it, I don't know about an adventure, but it's certainly intrepid in that I, I first met Andrew about five or six years ago when he was, uh, as a you know, master's student coming out of Alaska, was really trying to organize people around the idea of a comprehensive survey of the Gulf of Maine that would look at this ecosystem from top to bottom and would really bring in the birds, which is one of his passions, together with plankton and physics and, and all of the things that he's going to talk about tonight. And a number of us went to his meeting. We thought, wow, what a great idea. This kid's crazy. Um, we really thought that, that it would be a tall order to pull it off to find anybody to fund it, but Andrew has amazing determination and managed to really keep this vision alive, managed to, to work together with uh, uh, and build a group that was able to write a successful proposal that led to a uh, three-year study of the Gulf of Maine ecosystem, which he's going to talk about tonight. And in the meantime, Andrew's been uh, here and there, and including working a little bit as a Sternman, uh, uh, but all the while working at a, on a PhD at the University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst. And I am really excited that we actually have him here on our staff now. Uh, so I think uh, it was a huge coup for us. So I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, uh, uh, and we will listen to him tell us about the Gulf of Maine. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm not sure. Hopefully, the volume's OK. But uh, I don't know if you want your career described or early career described as an adventure, but it's nonetheless exciting. Um, and so today, I'm going to be talking about biological hotspots and finding birds, fish, and plankton in the Gulf of Maine. And so a lot of my work over the past year since starting here is kind of behind the computer screen and analyzing a lot of data. But fortunately, for a few weeks out of the summer, I get out from behind the computer and get to travel throughout the Gulf of Maine and kind of help find these things and understand uh, where they are and why they're there. And so to start, I'm actually going to begin kind of at the end of the talk. And here is actually some drone footage that's taken from this quadcopter that has four rotors and a mounted camera. Um, and right now we're off Monhegan Island. And what I want people to kind of think about when they're seeing this is, you know, this is probably a pretty common site along the main coast. You have racks of rockweed. Here you can see a common tern that's foraging. Um, and so some questions start to pop up, you know, what is it eating? Is it zooplankton or small fish? Um, and then some other things that I'll kind of go over throughout the talk is, yep? Can you sharpen that a little bit? I can't do anything about it, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so just some questions to think about are why we're focusing in on the bird, even though it's a fuzzy focus. Um, and then, you know, what's the importance of these different areas and how we go about studying them in terms of collecting data about what's going on in these, in these um, kind of what I'm going to call biologically, biologic, biologically diverse locations and then biological hotspots. And so for a more kind of traditional outline of tonight's talk, so I'll start with a background on biodiversity and kind of link that in to how we think about biodiversity and then also these biological hotspots. 
and then thinking about marine birds as indicators of these locations and then really getting into the bulk of the talk that focuses on this Gulf of Maine Coastal Ecosystem Survey, or uh, since we're in science, we need a cool acronym, so GOMSES is what we've called it. And then wrapping up with some future work and applications. And so this project's all funded through the State Wildlife Grants Competitive Program, and while I'm the fortunate or unfortunate one, depending on your feelings about public speaking, to be up here talking today, there's a variety of different researchers um, from multiple different agencies and uh, organizations. And my photographer throughout is Cameron, and Cameron's down here. So if you have any picture questions, I guess you can ask Cameron after. <laughs> uh, so to start, I'm going to kind of go through a primer on what is biodiversity. And so a simple definition is a variety of life in a particular system from genes to ecosystems. And I'm going to focus on ecosystems mostly for two potentially trivial but nonetheless very important reasons, mostly that I've never been good at explaining things I can't see, and you can just uh, check my organic chemistry grade for proof of that. And so if you think about biodiversity, you know, your first thought, or most people's thought apparently, uh, according to Google, is kind of these tropical ecosystems where you have different corals supporting a variety of different coral reef species. And if we look at this kind of across the globe, um, you know, you see similar patterns. So here the blue colors are lower biodiversity going up to red, which is higher. The black boxes are kind of the top 10%, so the most biodiverse locations. And you definitely see kind of this pattern that's kind of mid-latitudes bordering the equator where you're seeing really high diverse locations. Um, but then, you know, if you look at where we are here in the Gulf of Maine, you know, we are popping out as one of the most biodiverse locations um, in the world. And <clears throat> it's certainly cold here, but it is also productive. And a few different reasons for that, just walking through them. The first is kind of our geographic location. So we're a subpolar biome. I have to ask, thank Andy for that term. Um, and really what that means is we're kind of located between these two very different ecosystems. You have the cold Arctic to our north, northeast, and then more temperate mid-Atlantic. And ultimately what this comes down to is you get overlap in species that, you know, we could be at the southern edge of a species range that mostly is in the Arctic, or the northern edge of a species range that mostly exists in the mid-Atlantic. And since we're right in the middle, we have both species and in turn, you know, a pretty diverse uh, community of organisms. The other kind of few reasons to walk through are that we have uh, diverse physical habitats. And the first component of this is if you look at, um, it's a little blurry, but uh, you have a few major basin systems. So there's a really deep waters and you can contrast that with, you know, the bank or the coastal ecosystems that's much shallower. And so different depths different and different organisms kind of specialize in those different habitats. And even more clear, you can really see this just if you travel along the, main, or the Gulf of Maine coast going from Cape Cod National Seashore up to kind of what we think about as the traditional Maine rocky coast. And so these different physical habitats can support a variety of different biological communities and in turn you see the biodiversity. And, you know, within this physical setting, that kind of sets the stage, I guess, for where these organisms might live and reproduce and grow and survive. Um, but obviously you need food and nutrients. And so the Gulf of Maine is pretty unique. We have seven major river systems. Um, and then we're also getting influenced by kind of Gulf Stream waters that are coming up in here and interacting with colder Labrador current water. And that's all entering the Gulf of Maine and bringing, especially the Gulf Stream waters, uh, bringing nutrients to, this, to the system. And ultimately, once there, kind of the, the nutrients are being moved around within the water column, interacting, kind of moving over these different depths, and really being recycled. And one of the main things, you know, when you think of Gulf of Maine, especially the Bay of Fundy, you think about tides. So I think the mean tide range there is something like 14, 15 meters or 45 feet. Um, so a lot of mo water moving within the system that kind of helps upwell nutrients and cycle nutrients throughout the water column. And that really brings kind of the higher trophic level species, the stuff that I study in terms of birds and, uh, and whales. So if we think back to kind of what biodiversity looked like according to Google, you know, it's a nice fall, rainy day, which is my favorite, and it's much colder here. And so we don't see the coral tropical ecosystem. But what we do see is, you know, definitely we have a variety of different species that um, are in the Gulf of Maine. And so this is taken on Stellwagen Bank about uh, two summers ago, I guess. And so we were fortunate to come across this 
foraging flock of birds, and then we have a whale. And a few things just to point out here, you know, we're also there fishing. Um, and so we are a key part of this ecosystem. And a lot of times, you know, you will target birds if you are looking for fish. It's a pretty easy indicator that I'll get to later on. Um, and probably everybody's pretty familiar with something like herring gulls, but then you also see here sooty shearwater and great shearwater. I'll talk about those a little bit later on. Those are species that are here and they're not breeding. So they're kind of non-central place foragers. They have freedom to go throughout the Gulf of Maine. And then obviously the central character with uh, the humpback whale. So with these organisms, you know, a lot of us, there's an interesting way in which we view the ocean. You know, in one way it's kind of this big, vast blue blanket. And another kind of depth to that is maybe we come across a foraging flock like this or a patch of a lot of activity. But it's still really hard to see what's going on below the ocean surface. And so in this particular instance, you might have humpback whales that are foraging on sand lance. And then these small foraging fish, sand lance, are there themselves eating zooplankton, which again is grazing on phytoplankton, so kind of the primary producers of the ecosystem. And the big thing here is that, you know, when you come across something like this, you might catch the birds or the whales, but you're really not seeing all this stuff that's going on below the ocean surface. And ultimately, you know, kind of getting to why these locations are important before we walk into, you know, why we study them, I think one of the big things is thinking about them as, you know, this biodiversity is supporting these biological hotspots, that is what I like to call them. And ultimately, that's kind of thinking about how energy is being transferred through the food web. So if you have everything from copepods or small zooplankton at the base of the food web, on up to whales, you have pretty efficient energy transfer through the food web. And so an indicator of that is all these species together at the same spot in the same place. And another key part of this is that, you know, they're rare. Anybody that's probably gone out um, and tried to go fishing, um, you've probably looked at something like this where you might be looking at the vast ocean and not seeing anything. I know I've had many days like that. And so this is pretty rare where you come across these spots where you have a lot of biological activity. Um, and since they aren't the norm and species are so reliant on them for their own survival and productivity, you know, it's certainly important to understand where they are and why they're there. And the, the second component to this in terms of conserving biodiversity or these biological hotspots is thinking about how, you know, every species has a role that kind of maintains the function of the ecosystem. And for anybody that's been here um, to any talk at GMRI, you've probably already heard about Calanus finmarchicus, um, which is really key to the Gulf of Maine food web. And it's about the size of a grain of rice, um, but it's very energy rich and it supports things like herring. And then obviously you get the apex predators there like birds and whales that are coming to eat herring and sometimes even Calanus itself. So here highlighting the role of, you know, <clears throat> if you went out and looked at the ocean, you'd never see this, um, but it's certainly an important player within the Gulf of Maine food web and this idea that by conserving multiple species, you're maintaining those relationships and maintaining the food web and then also the function and, and uh, services that these ecosystems provide. So the big question, given their importance, uh, hopefully you've been convinced of that by now, is how do we find these? And this is actually not a Photoshop picture. When I practiced this, somebody thought it was, but it's not. Um, and so ideally, you know, this, well, except for it being a balloon, it might be nice if you could just go out and these locations were marked readily and you could easily observe them and go study them. But that's not the case. And so... With my background with marine birds, I might be a little bit biased, but I'm going to try and convince you all that I think marine birds can help us find these locations in these biological hotspots. And so here, just a picture of a puffin uh, giving everybody a hug as we get going. So what is a marine bird? A marine bird is a species that spends most of its life at sea, and it really only comes to land to breed. So this is not something you're going to go find at the McDonald's dump um, having a leftover Big Mac. These are things that are, are really only on land, and they only come to land kind of at these breeding colonies. Um, and hopefully I can show you one of those, but maybe not. I'll use this thing. Okay. So here's a kind of distribution map. The red dots are these managed seabird colonies within the Gulf of Maine. Um, and so ranging kind of from Cape Cod all the way up to uh, Grand Manan and Machias Seal Island area. And the interesting thing to point out is, 
you know, there's a ton, a lot more islands. I can't remember the exact number, but let's say 3,000 something islands in the Gulf of Maine. So in the birds, over 80% of the, of the seabirds, things like terns and puffins exist just on this subset of managed colonies. And a lot of that has to do with the predation that birds experience at unmanaged colonies. So you'll get everything from bald eagles, peregrine falcons, um, you'll even have mammals. Mink will swim out to the island and wreak havoc on the colonies. So they've kind of learned that, you know, being around humans and being at these managed locations, as well as with our um, attraction devices to bring them there, um, leads to high percentage of birds at you know, a few different colonies or islands spread out throughout the Gulf of Maine. And when you look at one of these, here's a picture from Petit Manan Island, and so you have the rocky uh, kind of outcrop, and here you have puffins mixed in with some razor bills that are really just loafing on the rock. And then here's kind of a better picture of an actual nest. Um, puffins are burrow nesters and cavity nesters, so they find cracks in the rocks and lay their nests and have or have their nests and lay their eggs there. Um, in contrast, things like terns that we'll talk about a little bit later, they nest more on the terrestrial side of the island. So just right on the grass of a front lawn, they'll nest right there. Um, and so this is kind of what we're dealing with in terms of marine birds in the Gulf of Maine and, and where they are. And a few other different characteristics, and one that I really wanted to point out um, is just this idea that they're long lived and so they have and they have small clutch sizes. So you know, most species have one to three eggs. And so the big one here is this uh, albatross that doesn't exist in, in uh, the Gulf of Maine, unfortunately. Um, but you could kind of think of it as a supersized shearwater. Um, and it just recently in 2016, at 65 years old, uh, successfully raised a chick. Um, and how they know that is, I don't know if people can see this red band here. Um, but basically when birds are chicks, researchers will go out and put bands on them and then recite them throughout their lives to get an idea of not only their movement, but also their survival. Um, so definitely one of the, one of the more interesting uh, anecdotes that you get to learn about uh, as a marine bird ecologist. And thinking back to kind of the wing morphology, you have things like puffins that have pretty short um, kind of squat wings. They're pretty heavy, and really they're adapted to go underwater and capture their prey by swimming underwater. And you could contrast that with something like a tern that has longer wings and much lighter and really adapted for long-distance migration. And this kind of breakdown really helps in terms of or looking at the Gulf of Maine seabird community in terms of their foraging strategy and those two ideas of you're either kind of a pursuit diver where you're kind of landing on the water surface and then you're diving down and propelling through the water using your wings to capture your prey or you're one of these surface feeders like a tern and there you know you're traveling around you're trying to locate prey at the surface and your wings are kind of adapted that you can actually hover in place and really try and time your dive um, to when, the, when you're going to have the greatest success of capturing something. And so just to look at a few of these different species and thinking about this in terms of who's here during, and breeding here versus who's here and, non -breed, and not breeding. Um, so for breeding species, most of, the, most of these um, are all kind of pursuit diving pelagic, I guess, Atlantic puffin, razorbills, um, they're kind of more offshore. Guillemots you'll actually see pretty close. They eat things like rock gunnels, so benthic, small benthic fish. Um, for surface feeding, breeding species, we have common terns, arctic terns. We also have some roseate terns. And then also leeches, storm petrel. And there's an interesting contrast here where terns will actually kind of hover above a ball of bait and then have the capability to really dive down but just get barely under the water surface and pop back up. In contrast, leeches, storm petrels really just run across and walk across the water, which is kind of why they have the nickname Jesus birds by some people. Um, and then for non-breeding species, kind of interestingly actually, we don't have many pursuit diving species that are here during the non-breeding season. I think a lot of this is because those generally aren't long distance migrants. So if they're not really here during the summer, um, they're probably not, or not during the breeding season, they're probably not here during the non-breeding. But the exception is a dove key, which is a small alcid species, and they're foraging mostly on copepods, um, whereas these guys are mainly fish. Um, and then non-breeding, for surface feeding, we have a much bigger and diverse community, a lot of different shearwater species, and then the Wilson storm petrel, again, displaying kind of that walking on water um, technique. I should have had like that Walking in Memphis song playing in there, but it was pretty <laughs>
Um, and so now we've got an idea of what's out there and kind of an overview of how we actually study these, these species. And so a lot of it comes down to counting birds from a variety of different platforms. Um, here I was fortunate to work on Petit Manan Island, which is down east for an entire summer. And as somebody not a fan of heights, that tower count was always dreadful. I think I wore off my right shoulder just pinning it against the, uh, the wall on the spiral staircase. And then I, uh, some work I did earlier on um, in Alaska. And there, putting a ladder up kind of on the rock face and getting an idea of how many eggs and how many chicks are in each of these nests to get an idea of the productivity. Um, and then more recently, a lot of counting birds from boats. And so this is really the Gulf of Maine Coastal Ecosystem Survey work where I'm on the bow with binoculars. I've got an uncomfortable headset and radioing down observations to somebody below deck that records them on the computer. And, of course, you know, marine bird ecologists, or if you're in any type of field ecology, you kind of have to improvise. And so here, you know, a case of needing to put a small boat on a bigger boat. Um, I'm sure there was a reason for this, but you can really just never have enough boats. Um, somewhat more recently, we've been trying to get at what's going on with birds at sea, and a lot of this is based on capture and tagging work. Um, and so here, capturing great shear waters in Stellwagen Bank, and you can kind of see us uh, up on the boat and with a small dip net, and really you kind of just put squid or sand lance in the water. Um, shear waters are not the brightest, I don't think, but they swim up real close, and when they put their head under, you can scoop them up. And then bring them back to the boat, um, and then we're putting on this satellite transmitter tag, um, to monitor their movements. And so it's actually, this one's actually solar powered. So instead of needing a real heavy battery, you just have a small solar panel that um, re basically gets it to recharge and you can get um, more data. Um, and we also do this type of stuff at night. So here's some work that I did in Alaska. And so everybody, you know, driving around Maine knows what happens when you see a deer in your headlights, they freeze. Um, Kitlitz's merlets are very similar. Um, so you can actually spotlight them on the water, and if you're going full speed um, in this little Zodiac that has like a 30 horsepower motor, um, you'll have just enough time to reach over and dip them, scoop them up before, uh, before they fly off. Um, and we certainly broke many, many nets in trying to do that just because of the torque that's put on it as you're driving, driving up on them. Um, but again, this idea of putting on tags to kind of get a better understanding of what birds are doing when they're going to sea. So as I think probably the first day of like, if you had a marine bird ecology class, it's, it's pretty much driven home that birds could be this, these indicators of all these different things. And one of them is this idea of uh, marine birds as indicators of biological hotspots. And certainly a great idea. We've seen kind of how you can see them from a distance. They're easily located. Um, all these factors kind of lead evidence, I guess, to why they might be uh, good indicators of these biological hotspots. And I want to pull out two of those, the most important, I guess, in my opinion. The first is that, you know, for something to be sensitive to or, or needing to locate these hotspots, they need to be somewhat sensitive to them. So they need to be, um, you know, able or, or they need to be uh, going to find them regularly. They also need to be, you know, see responses when, you know, those locations aren't necessarily around where they are. And so this is really describing what, what that looks like um, within more quantitative um, analysis, looking at a variety of different seabird species that are foraging all on different things, ecosystems, you know, across the globe. And what I want to point out is, you know, here you're dealing with where you have rel readily available prey abundance or prey availability. And then as we move down, it's getting, it's declining. And as that's happening, we're seeing a decline in the bird productivity. So certainly lending the um, supporting evidence to the fact that marine birds are sensitive to these changes in prey and, and thus you know, need to locate these hotspots for their survival and the survival of their young. And the second component that I kind of touched on is that you know, they're very easily located and counted. And so here's a series of pictures um, that were also from two summers ago. And so I'm just going to kind of walk through these. Um, but right now, probably everybody's kind of just seeing white blobs, um, which is really gulls. And a lot of gulls are kind of coming in um, to this central foraging flock. And as we get closer, you know, we start to see some of the smaller species. So Atlantic puffins here, which again are the pursuit divers. So they're actually probably under the water for the most of the time. Um, 
and zooming in even more, um, you know, we can kind of start, it's a little blurry here, but you can kind of start to see um, this bird in particular. And if we look at what it's got, it's got juvenile herring, so herring that's about this big in its bill. Um, and so, you know, from a distance, all you see is this foraging flock of gulls. Um, and then as you get closer, you're kind of getting a better idea of what's going on um, with other trophic levels. In this case, now seeing, seeing that they're foraging on these juvenile herring. And so I have a few different pictures that kind of show this. Again, this is that same whale foraging flock. Again, you know, birds being there probably because of the whales, but also because of the prey. And then even if we go to kind of a more down east coastal ecosystem where we don't necessarily have humpbacks there all the time breaching and foraging, um, you do still get birds that are kind of locating these, these areas of high prey density. Um, and in this case, you're seeing, you know, you have a turn here and it's hard to see, but it actually does have a fish. You have a variety of different gull species. And then in the back here, you have puffins. Um, and you can almost kind of think about puffins in this situation acting like that humpback whale. So they're going down, they're swimming around under the water, balling up the prey and pushing it up to the water's surface where, you know, these guy turns and uh, other gulls that need to, foraging right on the surface are able to, to eat them as well. So just to recap kind of what these two ideas are, one that they're reliant on um, the marine resources throughout their lives, um, and then also that they're easier to study than the other stuff under the water column. Kind of two pieces of convincing evidence for why marine birds might be good indicators of these biological hotspots. And so if we try and kind of flesh that out through what we know about what's going on with marine birds in the Gulf of Maine, um, here we can kind of see a productivity plot. So on the right hand side, it's basically three different colonies that you can kind of see right up here. Um, and then basically the idea here is that across both of these, so Atlantic puffins and then Arctic terns, there's definitely year to year variability, but overall there seems to be this declining trend. And when we try and then make the link to, you know, what's going on with their prey, we don't necessarily have the data to support what was going on in that first example. But what we do have is a lot of different observations. And one of the big things that seems to be coming out is these puffins and then also terns are bringing back butterfish, which are kind of the size of a silver dollar. And so the best analogy I could come up with is if you tried to eat a pizza without slicing it. So if you just tried to put the whole thing in your mouth, you probably wouldn't be too successful. Um, and so not able to eat the fish there in turn, um, not able to get the nutrients and energy they need and the productivity declines. So what you can see from this is, you know, we have these observations of, of what's going on with the birds and their prey, but it's really only telling us so much of the story. And a lot of that kind of comes back to this mysterious at sea ecology of marine birds. Um, and so the best way to kind of go through this, I think, is to think about how we kind of go grocery shopping. Um, and so here, if you just Google grocery stores in the Gulf of Maine, or the Gulf of Maine, <laughs> it's on the brain, uh, Portland, Maine, you see a variety of different options. And, and a few characteristics to think about is that these are static or they're constant in space and time. So they're not moving around. Um, and they're relatively consistent in the availability of the foods that you can get there. And then there might be some minor differences, but um, they're relatively consistent in the food prices. So a very overall, a very um, consistent, reliable um, a way of shopping, I guess. We don't really deal with variability. And if you think about instead now the birds, it's a totally different situation. So you have a very dynamic environment. Everything's changing in space and time. You have inconsistent availability of food. So you could think about even something as small as, you know, within one day, a daily cycle, you have stuff like copepods, colonists that's vertically migrating through the water column. Presumably the small herring are also trying to match that so that they can eat the, the copepods. And then the birds are trying to, you know, match that. And they're really restricted, especially something like terns, to foraging during the daytime when presumably the prey is at depth. Um, so just overall inconsistent availability of foods, and that in turn drives, you know, these very variable energetic costs of foraging. Um, and there should be, that was a horrible misspell, but that's okay. <laughs> and so these two ideas kind of coming together, not only that, uh, you know, filling these mystery or the at-sea knowledge gaps in this mysterious at-sea ecology of marine birds, 
And then also doubling that kind of with locating biological hotspots in the Gulf of Maine really gave rise um, to the Gulf of Maine Coastal Ecosystem Survey that I've been fortunate to work on for the past uh, three years. And so getting into that, you know, I'll put this up here and, and we'll dive a little bit further into it. But the big thing I want people to pull out from this is this idea of an integrated ecosystem-based study design. And I'm going fast because it's better in pictures. Um, but really what this means is we're trying to collect data on a variety of different species at the same place and at the same time to hopefully relate everything together. And if we look at this in pictures, here's kind of a... a a map of where we were able to go during one summer and the few key things to point out are um, just the solid black lines and then the red circles. And so this is kind of a combination of two sampling programs. And so the first part is these continuous transects that are the solid lines. And there we're doing marine bird and mammal observations. So you have somebody again up at the bow observing, radioing down to somebody entering the data down below. And then we also have uh, fish acoustics. And so you can think about this really as just a fancy fish finder. Um, and so it looks like this. There's three different transducers that are mounted in that box. And then it's mounted on the side with a pole that kind of goes up and down. So it's down when we're on transect. And then the data you get is kind of this backscatter that it's not necessarily the best for species identification, but you can kind of get an idea of broad uh, functional groups. The second component are these red circles, and these are the fixed sampling stations. And here we're mostly focusing on the biological oceanography. Um, and so the first part of this are these zooplankton nettos. And here we're dropping down a really fine um, mesh net that we basically put overboard, drop it down, pull it back up. And then the samples poured through this sifting tray. Um, and then you're able to count the organisms and figure out what species are there. Uh, the second piece of equipment is this conductivity temperature depth meter, um, which is shown right here. And this, again, is dropped over the side, and it's collecting continuously with depth, um, things like salinity, temperature, chlorophyll. Um, and you also have these bottles right here that are open, and when you go down and as you're coming up, um, somebody in the wheelhouse is able to trigger the bottle, and essentially the top and the bottom close, and you really get a slice of the water column. And so once you have that, you could look at things like nutrient concentrations at different depths of the water column. But again, this idea of really trying to get an exhaustive picture of different species across trophic levels, as well as what's going on with their physical environment to hopefully understand what's going on at these biologically important areas, as well as where, you know, things aren't necessarily um, that active. And so here's a picture of, of and three different maps of where we were able to go despite some weather over the three years. Um, we were able to get almost all the way from, you know, Cape Cod Bay basically to as far down east as we could get, um, all on this 50-foot research vessel that's out of uh, the University of New Hampshire. And so here are just a few slides of kind of what life's like at sea. Um, here we are working on the back decks. So you have somebody putting away the zooplankton net. Um, Brian, the captain and first mate Deb here and Brian here are operating the winch, which we're not allowed to operate, thankfully. And then here we have the CTD meter that's getting ready to be deployed. And then again, kind of looking at what that looks like from the wheelhouse. Here's the computer that's hooked up to the CTD meter that allows you to control those bottles and, and and also control the up and down of the CDD, CTD meter. And then most importantly, we have a bacon delivery transportation specialist um, that's feeding bacon to the marine bird people that are up on, on the bow. So living, um, this is a small picture and it's actually small living quarters, so I don't feel too bad about it. Um, here are you know, the bunks, and these are about six feet, probably six feet long, and for anybody that's been camping, you know, the standard thermarest width. Um, and, you know, there's anywhere between probably six and eight of us down there at one time. They're also slanted a little bit, but for anybody that's probably slept on a fishing boat, this is very luxurious, so I don't want to make it sound too bad. Um, here's kind of a kitchen space, and then here's a wet lab space, which is actually filled with stuff when we're underway and, and working. Um, and so given the small, you know, small quarters, we basically try and take every, every opportunity to get off the boat. We do eat very well. Um, I think Walmart, we had something like four or five carts of, uh, of food. Um, and then you also do get to see some pretty cool places. So here's one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is from the Coast Guard dock in Jonesport, looking out over the pier, and then the church at the center of town uh, with sunset. So 
small living, but uh, you definitely get to see some really cool stuff. And so now kind of towards wrapping this up and thinking about this big question, we're still analyzing a lot of this data, but we do have preliminary insights I'd like to kind of share. And one main story is looking at our marine birds really re leading us to these biological hotspots. And I think it comes down to kind of a contrast in two different species or groups of species. So here we have a distribution of shearwaters in two different years. So here 2014 and then here 2015. Um, bird counts are in blue, so the bigger the circle, the more birds. And then kind of measure of biomass um, from the acoustics is uh, kind of the surface that the bird observations are overlaid on. Darker colors mean more. Um, and so what we're seeing is these non-central place foragers. So again, these shearwaters are here during the non-breeding season. They're able to go throughout the Gulf of Maine. They, can have, they have free range to go find kind of the most, the most energetically beneficial locations. And I think what we're seeing is these generally overlap with kind of highest biomass um, in terms of what we're seeing with the backscatter. So if you look even you know, throughout the region and then even across years and also within transects, so here's a good example where they're both kind of concentrated on a little bit darker spot. They seem to be targeting these highest biomass locations. In contrast, the central place foragers, so those are things that are here during the breeding season, um, we don't necessarily see that relationship. So, you know, here uh, they're definitely kind of targeting some of these higher biomass areas, but there's, you know, a lot of biomass just offshore here. And then, and it seems like, you know, a lot of this is probably due to the fact that they have to return regularly to the different colonies. But interestingly, it seems like a lot of these spots, and I'll key in on these two um, highlighted in the black box, also seem to be trophically diverse, I guess. So getting back to that idea of kind of trophic energy transfer. Um, so in this case, uh, in 2015, we have terns. We also have puffins there. If we look at some of the zooplankton data, so kind of the primary or, or base of the food web, really, um, you know, you see this dark circle in red, which again is kind of overlapping where we had in turn areas and alcid areas. Um, and the interesting thing here is at a lot of these locations, we weren't necessarily, necessarily seeing birds coming to the surface or with bill loads of fish. And so in talking to the biological oceanographers on the survey, um, they were wondering, you know, well, what are the birds actually foraging on? And based on that, we kind of started looking at jellyfish as this potential um, meal delivery system. You could almost think of them as like little snacks that the adult turns and, and especially the turns and the, those surface feeders, they're able to just go down. The, the jellyfish themselves are probably there eating copepods. And so they have some energetic content um, and energetic value. And this is certainly something that wouldn't necessarily come up if you think back to that picture of the puffin with the with um, butterfish in its bill. You know, you'd never pick up on a jellyfish being in there. So definitely an interesting insight and a testament, I think, to kind of this idea of of bringing researchers with different backgrounds together to kind of answer these questions. So what's next for us? Um, I think the big step will be trying to develop these prey energy surfaces. And this gets to a lot more of the work that I've been doing recently. Um, and the idea here is that you, you, we have our observations from these different sampling sites. Uh, but if we are able to kind of propose a model or think about a, an idea and propose a quantitative method for how that would help describe that pattern, then we can actually make some inferences and really pr predictions. So without that, you know, especially uncertainty in those predictions, just based on the observations, you can't really do that. And so this is kind of the next, I guess, the next step for the Gulf of Maine uh, survey work is kind of using especially the zooplankton data to get an idea of where prey energy is distributed within the Gulf of Maine. And ultimately, then we'd be able to overlap uh, marine birds with those prey energy surfaces to kind of test this idea that birds are locating trophically diverse or areas where you have high energy transfer uh, within the Gulf of Maine. And so why does all this matter as if we're wrapping up? Um, I think it kind of comes back to this grocery store idea. And so we, you know, we already know things are very dynamic with this system. Um, but as everybody knows, there's also a lot of, of changes going on, especially recently um, due to climate change. And so here, if you focus first on um, just this graph right here, you can see temperature anomalies. So this is the differences in temperature relative to a long-term average. And you see, you know, especially very recently, the trend is 
that were warming very fast. And you can actually look at how this trend compares to other ecosystems throughout the world. Um, here um, in a map, and again, seeing this highlighted red here in the Gulf of Maine, but also just plotting these out. And it comes come to find out that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the planet, um, thanks to a lot of work by Andy and others here. Um, so certainly a lot, of, a lot of changes that are going on in terms of the physical environment. And with those physical changes, uh, species are going to have to adapt. One of the first things you might think of is changes in species ranges. So you could think about fish as a perfect example. Most of them have kind of a preferred thermal or preferred temperature uh, range that they like to exist at. If that range is shifting, they're probably going to move with it. Um, the other thing that might be influenced is a major is the timing of these kind of major life 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 events in terms of phytoplankton bloom, so that really kickstarts things in the in the spring and then the fall and providing the food for most of the rest of the summer, the primary production. Um, and then fish, bird and, birds and whales, a lot of what they're doing is trying to time their movements and their, and their life events to those, um, to the plankton bloom, but then also, you know, matching it on up as you move up the trophic level. So in terms of how the fish are reacting and the birds are reacting to the fish. So what it comes down to is that, you know, with this warming, there probably could be the potential that there's this disruption and the ability of organisms to overlap in space and time with the resources that they need. And we're certainly um, not, uh, we're, we're, we certainly have that same challenge. If you just think about, you know, anybody that's been out lobstering or fishing, you, oh, that's what you're doing. You're trying to go out there and, and find these things in space and time. And so with any changes, um, it's going to influence how, how your daily activity, but also potentially over the long term, your sustainability. And so here's kind of just a quick wrap-up video. Um, a, a lot of this is, again, based on our survey work. And again, what I want to leave people with is this idea that, you know, we certainly have these coastal communities that are, are relying on these hotspots themselves. But then also going back to this idea of the birds, here's a few flying around, um, and using them really to indicate where these spots are. And the best kind of picture of why I think this is important is just displayed here. So when the clip starts, it's you know an empty ocean view, and then you have this huge basking shark that's coming through. And really, we need to be able to find these locations, study them, and, and the idea being that, you know, that first, the movie with the basking, sh or the clip with the basking shark, you could think about that as a location changing over time um, more dramatically. So, you know, you might have regions within the Gulf of Maine that right now might not be that supporting that much biological activity, but certain in, certainly in the future, given system changes, um, they might be. And, and to understand where those are going to be, we really need to understand, you know, why they're there now and then use the statistical tools to make predictions and hopefully figure out um, where they are, why they're there, and then with that allow time to kind of plan for those changes and adapt to those changes. So thank you. Um, and for more information, check out the blog. Because I'm sweating under the hot light. So questions for Andrew. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's polynias in uh, the Arctic yep. that are known for this. Uh, kid, but I, I, I wonder at how you're going about it, because I have to think that what makes it rich is under the surface, and you're sort of looking for a marker of underneath. Are, are you tempted at all to try and better define what it is underneath that's making it occur there, and, and how, what leads do you have on that? Yeah, so I think that's an interesting point. We just had a meeting, I guess, last spring, and one of the things is we didn't actually see that many birds while we were out there. There's just not as many out there. But I think with having the biological oceanographers out there, they really understand the physics of the system, and then mostly those copepods thinking about Calanus. And so we're kind of flipping things around now to look at if we can, if we have a lot of data on the base of the food web, maybe that's where we start and then look at how birds are using that to see if there is a correlation um, between where birds are and those really rich um, prime, kind of primary production areas, but mostly zooplankton and small forage fish. Are there easy ways to track copepods? Can you add it electromagnetically or uh, you know, with a camera or, or 
We tried a camera, but it was broken. I think probably for the most accurate, or the, the best guesses, I think, are based on drift models, um, and then interacting those with the currents of the system. And really, you know, there are models for the Gulf of Maine that are three-dimensional um, and driven by physics, but you get the whole water column that's being modeled. Um, so our, our idea is to kind of, you know, one of the great uses of this data might be to hopefully validate or test, you know, how well those models are at predicting. Yeah. So jellyfish are nutritious. <laughs> Maybe not in themselves, um, but I think they, since they're eating copepods, they're basically serving up, basic, it's almost like a package of, um, you know, gummy bears or something. So the, the, the plastic wrapper, the jellyfish, isn't that nutritious, but what's inside it, what it's eating in terms of the copepods might be. So that's kind of the idea that we're pursuing. And, and the other thing I, I wanted to ask is, we have this new national monument now, which is Cassius Ledge. Yep. Oh. No. No. Uh, so, um, it's a canyon. Yeah. The canyon. They yep. wanted Cassius, but they didn't get it. So what yeah. did they get? It's it's kind of uh, it's like southeast of Georgia's Bank, um, more mid Atlantic area. So, are they a particularly rich area for all these? I I didn't see anything way offshore that was particularly rich in your study. Yeah. So we and a lot of that is probably because we focus only kind of on the coastal area. So we really wow. targeted those shallow shallow waters. Um, I don't know too much about the canyons. I do know that there's evidence that puffins go there to overwinter, um, some preliminary evidence. It's based on a few tagged animals. But, um, and I, don't, I know it's a big fishing spot, but other than that, I, so presumably it's important. Further research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Is there any way to uh, judge the seriousness of the decline in the uh, herring uh, mass? here in the Gulf of Maine. I, I know it, as you mentioned, affects uh, birds like puffins. Uh, it also affects lobster. Right. <laughs> uh, any, any thoughts there? Um, so I think, you know, maybe you're talking about the most recent one um, in terms of the collapse. And I heard barrels of bait, you know, doubled or even tripled, especially kind of in southern Maine. Um, that's definitely one way, I guess, of getting at that, and it might even get more attention than, say, what's going on with the birds at the colonies. Um, one of the things that they do do is they put uh, researchers out in these blinds, and you're overlooking a bunch of nests. And so as an adult comes in with a fish, you record um, what fish it is to the best of your ability. Um, and so we are, they're starting to try and use cameras to get an even better idea of what they're bringing back. Um, but you'd certainly see it over the long term um, in terms of the productivity within a season um, for the birds. The interesting thing is that they are really incredible in their buffering capability. So even though you might have a local decline in herring, if they go the extra distance, they might be able to be able to find them. So I think two very different um, proxies of, of what happens when herring declines. One, in terms of how it influences us and the lobstermen, but then also we're seeing it with the birds. So probably combining those two stories would make a pretty powerful argument. Yep. What is your favorite bird? <laughs> intelligence. What's your favorite bird? Um, I I really like the Kitlitz's Merlet that that was shown there. Um, so they're really really cool. They nest in these glacial fjords, um, and they're non-colonial. So most seabirds are colonial. Um, they nest like thousands and thousands of feet on these rocky peaks and then fly all the way down on a daily basis into these glacial fjord waters, and they're right up next to calving glaciers. Um, so they're definitely probably my favorite. Are they much like dove geese? They look pretty similar. Yeah, yeah, they're very similar. Um, Killitzes eat a little, probably a little bit more fish. Um, they have a bill that's more like, almost like a black guillemot than it is with a dove key that has almost like a puffiny looking bill. Yep. So if you're looking at marine seabirds in the coastal zone, how representative are the populations there of, the, of their populations generally? I mean, how much further out into the Gulf of Maine do they go? I think most of the ones we are studying and focusing on, um, because their colonies are pretty close to shore, they're remaining pretty close to shore. It's pretty interesting, even things like puffins um, and razorbills, 
Um, they'll actually head, so like colonies that are located just off of Penobscot Bay, maybe eight miles out, they'll actually fly back into the bay um, to get a lot of their food. So they seem to be targeting that coastal area. Um, and it's m more rare that you'd see them a lot offshore. So if you remember kind of down east Jordan Basin area, um, when we drove out there, we didn't really see any kind of these breeding species, but what we did see were the storm petrels. Um, and so they're much more kind of a pelagic species than offshore. Where do the non-breeding species breed? So the shearwaters are pretty interesting. Great shearwaters actually breed in the Tristan de Cunha Islands, which is basically right between Argentina and the tip of South Africa in the middle of the South Atlantic. Wow. So our tagging data shows that they kind of hang out in the Gulf of Maine, they wrap, they actually start going north um, to the mid-Atlantic Ridge area and then kind of come down the coast of Europe and Africa and then a, almost like a big figure eight. Um, and then you have things like Arctic terns that are here and they're here during the breeding season, but they're going all the way down to Antarctica for the non-breeding season. So a very long flight. Mm -hmm. And storm petrels go opposite directions. Yeah, storm petrels are really, they did um, some work on leeches storm petrels that are breeding here in Canada, and they're flying all, like Nova Scotia area, they're flying all the way out to the continental shelf and staying out for one or two days and then bringing back food for their chicks. So a pretty expensive trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Um, I think you showed a picture of a tern eating a butterfish. Yep. So after working on, I worked on boats for several years, and I saw a lot of butterfish mixed with squid. and heard the squid are, um, their range is changing towards the northward regions, yep. and I was wondering if you see, if you're seeing any more butterfish here, if that's going to be a bigger problem if that is the forage species for those terns. Yeah, there's been, at a lot of the different colonies, there's, you know, researchers out there every summer, and a lot of their, that bill load observation data, so seeing what chick, what adults are bringing back for their chicks, seems to be showing some peaks recently in butterfish. Um, but it's kind of it's kind of funny. You get you know very um, localized differences. So down east of kind of Penobscot Bay, the colonies will be doing one thing, and you'll be seeing you know especially Petite Manan when I was there a lot of butterfish. And then you kind of come south and go past Penobscot Bay, and things that are you know Casco Bay are actually able to find you know herring and sand lance and stuff like that. So it's it's a really interesting question. I think they also um, they feed a lot. I think I think butterfish maybe feed on jellyfish too, and then there's some also relationship to dogfish somewhere. Either dogfish I think are eating butterfish or something like that. But um, yeah. So maybe one more question. I'm conscious of the fact that these chairs were designed for fifth graders. So one more question. <laughs> I'm losing weight up yeah. here. It's kind of nice. What is causing the major increase in the temperature? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a stab. So um, my simplest explanation, and I don't understand um, atmospheric circulation patterns, but in terms of oceanography, what we're seeing is the north wall of the Gulf Stream is shifting north. And it's really all related to kind of the global conveyor belt, circulation belt um, within the Atlantic. And since that seems to be slowing down a little bit, you're getting a movement northward in the Gulf Stream. And so the water that's coming into the Gulf of Maine is more influenced by Gulf Stream waters, um, despite, you know, melting in the Arctic. Um, it's kind of having this higher signal of saltier, warmer water. Um, and I don't necessarily understand the link with the atmosphere circulation patterns, but <laughs> that max is my, that's another I can't see it, so probably not the best at explaining it. All right, let's thank Andrew. So I just want to thank you all again for coming. I think this has been a fantastic lecture. We have two more in this series uh, on the November 10th. It's Crocodiles and Ice by John Turk. Uh, and on December 8th is Antillean Odyssey by Bob Stenick from the University of Maine. And if you haven't had a chance to see Bob Stenick, Bob Stenick talk, you need to come see his lecture. He is a fantastic local resource. He's, uh, he's one of my heroes.
Um, so I would encourage you, uh, uh, don't pass up John, but uh, definitely don't miss Bob. Uh, and, and if you enjoyed this lecture, I would, I would you know, encourage you to consider supporting us. There are a few envelopes out there uh, with donations like yours, allows us to do things like put on this lecture series and do some of the other work that we do uh, out there in the world. So thank you very much and have a great evening. Yeah, you're right.